Welcome to the Recover Me podcast with Warren Willie, doctor of osteopathic medicine, a best-selling author, and leading expert on holistic, healthy living. Warren is your guide to living a naturally healthier, happier life. So much of Western medicine, popular diets, and fitness fads put a bandage over health problems, addressing symptoms and not causes, offering short-term results at the expense of long-term health. That's why Warren is a man on a mission, to question the status quo and uncover holistic health solutions you can use in your life, starting right now. Now to get us started today, here's Warren. Hey, Warren Willie here. Welcome to another episode of Recover Me, the podcast. Remember, Recover Me Medicine is the medicine that weeps you where you are. I can't change your stressors, but I can help your body and mind deal with them better. This is a fun podcast because it's a little unique. For those of you who like to watch podcasts, you ain't going to be able to see squat on this one. This one's all audio. I have the honor to set up webinars with groups of people around the country. And one of my favorite things to do, and, and it seems to be popular out there, is for people just to call in, get on the webinar, and ask me any sort of health question they can do, think of. It's a lot of fun. It allows me to have to think. allows me to go off on tangents, which I'm really good at. And it's really fun. So this one was with a group of wonderful people out of Colorado. We got on a couple topics, even though there's a ton of questions asked, there was two primary topics we discussed. The first one was the power of protein, and the second one was on gut health. So hopefully you'll get a lot out of listening to this podcast. At the exit portion of this, I'll give you some ideas. If you're interested in setting up something similar to that, we can do it. So we're gonna jump right in. The first question was a little cut off. The question was, tell us about the power of protein and we go from there so hope you enjoy it it's good for you is there um, a level that's not good for you um, what happens if you have a low protein like and what would be considered low protein and that kind of stuff would be a nice start probably and then we can yeah. go from there sure absolutely um well first of all it's always always good to refresh your memory as to what a protein is because I actually had a couple of purely plant-based eaters in my office today, which is a very healthy way of eating if you can get in your protein amount, especially for a couple of their goals. One of them wants to be a uh, get into the fitness bodybuilding world. So, um, oh, uh -oh. did I miss a question? No. Okay. I hear some talking in the background when I'm hearing. So, oh, that may be. Um, so, uh, protein, as you recall, is anything that walked, crawled, swam, or flew at one time. Any animal base is a complete protein, and that's, that's where we have to distinguish uh, with our uh, wonderful plant-based eaters is where is the protein coming from and what else is with it. Protein, just as a refresher again, contains four calories per gram. So if you eat 10 grams of protein, you get roughly 40 calories from it. And proteins are made up of amino acids, um, of which there's essential, non-essential, and, and what we call semi-essential. Essential amino acids you have to get in your diet. Uh, non-essential amino acids your body can make from other amino acids. And then semi-essential amino acids, probably the most well-known ones called glutamine. Glutamine is the primary uh, amino acid in the muscles. And if you're a weightlifter, heavy exerciser, construction worker, heavy worker of some sort, then uh, glutamine becomes semi-essential because you burn it all up. Uh, your liver is very quick to tell your biceps to give up its glutamine uh, so it can turn it into sugar to feed your brain. Um, and that's of prime importance, as the word protein means, um, because you're from the neck down, you guys have heard me say this, entire job is to keep the neck up alive. And so if my brain needs sugar, it's going to smoke my biceps of glutamine to turn it into sugar through a process called gluconeogenesis. And that's why taking protein in, which is one of the many reasons, actually taking protein in on a regular basis is so important because especially if you're a heavy worker, under stress, uh, in the hospital, going through a rough relationship, anything that breaks down protein in your body has got to be replaced. 
Um, protein's essential for muscle contraction and movement. It makes uh, your hormones. It's the basis for most of your hormones. Um, it's required for activation of selected vitamins, B vitamins in particular. Uh, it's basically involved in everything regulatory, metabolic, physiologic, everything your body do uh, or does, protein is involved with. And from a dietary side, proteins are the most filling. In other words, when you eat protein, you feel more satisfied than when you eat carbs or even fat. Um, it's estimated that protein is more expensive to burn in your body. In other words, it has the highest metabolic uh, needs to utilize it uh, compared to protein and fat. And that's basically because when you eat protein, your body will replace your muscle protein with that good protein. In other words, there's a constant process of protein degradation or breakdown and protein buildup uh, as long as it's adequate in the diet again. Uh, and when you eat protein with carbohydrates, it helps keep blood sugar in track. So if you're dieting, you're insulin resistant, you're diabetic, um, and let's say your favorite thing in the world is a bowl of ice cream every night, that's great. Have it with some protein though. Throw some nuts and seeds on it. Have a scoop of peanut butter with it. Um, something to help slow down that sugar rush. Uh, that's uh, just some of the many things protein does. Any questions on any of that that I just covered? You, you mentioned that protein's filling, um, but then also that protein's made up of uh, you know the uh, essential, not not essential, and semi-essential um, amino acids. So for people that are getting it from plant-based, that's not protein. Is that not protein? Is that uh, a meat? Um, amino acids and is that is that as, as filling then or is there something oh. else in protein that's making it filling great question so uh, let's cover that vegetable sources are great sources of protein but you have to combine them so that's why we want to differentiate a complete protein like you find in meat or let's say a protein drink like a whey or casein powder and vegetable protein which you have to combine that's why you find peas and carrots in the uh, uh, frozen food section together, because peas and carrots make a complete protein. Your uh, rice, rice, and rice and beans. beans. Rice, rice and beans, beans. Yes. another great example, makes a complete protein. When you have that complete protein, then yes, it is more filling. The, the way it works is protein works on a hormone in your gut called grelin. Grelin, um, I like to nickname the road rage hormone, because when you're super hungry and people are gonna die unless you eat, that is grelin. And protein slows down grelin response. In other words, it turns it off, and, and so you're not raging for food anymore. When you eat it in combination, like with rice and beans, um, it works the same way. It slows down grelin response, and you feel more satisfied and happy. The issue with that is if you are calorie conscious, if you're insulin sensitive or whatnot, along with that complete protein of rice and beans is all the carbohydrates with it. And that's why a lot of people really argue, the, the, the carnivores in the world argue, well, you need a meat source so you don't have those extra carbs in your diet. Uh, to me, that's more very person-specific. I've worked with a couple very talented, top-level bodybuilders that are ve vegetarians, but they're not insulin resistant. They have no metabolic issues. Their hormones are perfect, right? So they have everything lined up to be able to eat a plant-based diet and still maintain a great degree of lean mass and muscle. So that's why I, I, I dislike when you start seeing posts on Facebook that cut down one food group and lift another one or rip one. You just can't do that because it's such an individual, it's so specific to the individual as to what they can and can't do that making a broad generalization that uh, meat's good and plant-based people are a bunch of hippies is not appropriate. That answer your question there? Yeah, 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 thanks. Awesome, awesome. So again, your best protein sources, any animal product, um, so dairy's an animal product, uh, goat's milk, is an animal product. Nuts and seeds are great sources of protein. Those come in all sizes, shapes, and forms. Uh, a little shout out to my absolute favorite type of seed uh, because it's the time of the year is pumpkin seeds. Uh, 
One of the side advantage of pumpkin seeds, so everyone knows, pumpkin seeds have the highest source of natural magnesium in nature. And so everyone's mag levels should be at their peak this month and next month eating pumpkin seeds. Um, vegetable sources we talked about, processed proteins or like your, your milk byproducts, casein and whey, soy, egg, all those um, are where you get them. The, what, what, where people have issues with them are some of the professed concerns uh, uh, from probably non-protein lovers um, out there. And those are fourfold. Uh, I'll list them and then I'll explain each one. Kidney damage, poor bone health, increased cancer risk, and heart disease. Those are the big four of uh, protein arguers, people that don't like the higher uh, suggested loads of protein that we have some people do. So let me cover each one of those for you. The first one, kidney damage. All of the research on that has been done in people with kidney damage already. So people that are close to dialysis or on dialysis, yeah, their total protein intake should be a slightly on the lower side. But there's never been a study to show that people with normal kidney function have any issues with protein. And the Swedish Institute of Sports Medicine did a couple studies at three to five grams per pound a scale weight in athletes over months and saw no changes in kidney function. Um, very important uh, to know. Now, that being said, back to the individual, some people, the high protein, particularly the processed protein. So if someone has two or three uh, whey protein drinks a day, they might have a slight bump in their creatine level in their kidneys, which would make any doctor out there say, uh-oh, your kidneys are stressed. But it's not, there's never been a study to show that that's long-term issues. If they cut back on their protein drinks and go to real food, we see that creatine level drop. Um, so hopefully that'll clear up a little bit about kidneys. Just an FYI, the nephrologists here in my town, the kidney doctors, send all their weight loss patients to my clinic. And we put them all on 0.8 to 1 gram of protein per kilogram, which is the even higher than the RDA. And these are people in renal failure and they all seem to do fine, but they do better everywhere else in life. Because again, everything I told you that protein does from boosting the immune system, help them maintain some lean mass and individual functioning. That's why all the nephrologists use us in town because it really spares function when protein is adequate amount. There was some research on poor bone health and high protein levels. Uh, the problem with that research, when you really read it, one, it was done in, in men and women who already had osteoporotic changes, so they already had some bone loss. And two, it was when calcium wasn't adequate in the diet, hence the poor bone health. And higher protein has is, is been said to, quote, leach calcium from the bones, but that's been very well disproven when you are taking enough calcium in your diet. Uh, and I'm not a big fan of calcium pills, so I try to get uh, natural dietary calcium. Uh, my personal favorite source is almond milk. It has roughly 30% more calcium than even dairy. But I eat a lot of cheese and have a glass of milk here and there and, and uh, homemade yogurt, um, all those. That's your, and, and then all your greens. Your vegetables are natural sources of calcium. So when your protein content's high, but you're eating all your greens and some almond milk or whatever floats your boat, um, there's no issue with bone health. Um, the cancer argument is uh, because they looked at protein from uh, meat sources. So uh, they didn't account for high saturated fats in the uh, primarily beef uh, in some of the studies that said there may be a link between cancer rates and um, uh, protein content. And so that just shows you there's other variables involved here. Uh, and, and when you deal with cancer or heart disease, something that's so multifactorial, you cannot in any way, shape or form point your finger at one thing. There's always other issues involved. So that data, as far as pure protein, has also been kind of pushed aside by most of the the medical experts in those fields saying an adequate protein diet, low saturated and trans fats is a very cancer 
protective and heart disease uh, preventative eating plan. Um, a lot of the plant-based research for um, heart disease came from a guy named Dean Ornish out of uh, San Francisco. And he showed that a strict vegetarian diet actually reverses coronary artery plaques. Um, again, you can't hang your hat on that's the only variable. All these people were meditating, doing yoga. They're on a number of supplements. So when they did these angiographic uh, studies showing decreased plaques with a plant-based diet. They were also doing everything else right. So just something to be aware. Anytime you read a study or, or see a post on a, uh, a medical fact, always be suspicious and think of as many variables as you can that might not have been accounted for with those. Any questions on that? Because I know Rich said there was some concern about higher protein amounts. So, so I spent a so little I, more I, I heard you say one gram per kilogram, not one gram per pound. Right. Is that the recommendation? No, that's that's what we do. I thought I've heard one gram per pound before. Yeah, the, the one gram per kilo is what we do for renal patients, people on dialysis. Oh, gotcha. Okay. For you guys, my recommendation is all one to 1.2 gram per pound. So one per right. one, one, you don't one have, per pound, not kilogram. Okay. Right. You're not in kidney failure. So the okay. the uh, the RDA or recommended recommended uh, dietary allowances for protein is 0.8 grams per kilo, so it's a very small amount compared to what we usually suggest in the world of fitness, weight loss, recovery, etc. So why is that so low, Warren? You know that's a good question. Um, and of course, if I get on my conspiracy theorist box, I'll say because the ag industry is a lot more powerful than the meat industry. Um, but I think that when those recommendations were made, uh, those are all made in the 50s and 60s. I think it was a very different world. Um, we didn't have the stressors. We didn't have a lot of disease states. Everyone was still active because they didn't have iPhones or iPads or TVs, right? It's just was such a different world that that low amount probably was sufficient for health back then. Um, it's a different world today and those recommendations should have changed because of the high stress, high activity, go, go, go type A personality traits that we're all told we have to have. Uh, we're just not recovering as well on that lower amount of protein. So that would be my guess. Okay, that's good. Yeah, any other questions about concerns? And just to repeat those, kidney damage, bone health, cancer, and heart disease are the big four. Um, since you're talking about kidneys and everything, is there a certain amount of water that you should be intake for, uh, especially if you're taking in more protein? Oh, great, great question. So your water recommendations are tough. There's so much argument as to how much is enough. By the American College of Sports Medicine standard, they suggest 0. 0.6 um, in uh, fluid ounces, 0.6 fluid ounces per pound of scale weight. So roughly if you know, if you're 150 pounds, 90, 90 fluid ounces um, is what they suggest. Now that changes with exercise, that number actually goes up to 0.75 fluid ounces per pound of scale weight. So that tries to uh, account for the vigorous activity, losing water, losing electrolytes and whatnot. But those, I run into studies that combat that and argue that all the time. There is something called psychogenic polydipsia, where people drink so much water, they suppress sodium. Because remember, your electrolytes in your system are all very finely tuned. If you drink too much water and dilute your sodium, you can die. Uh, it lowers sodium and your brain actually swells and you die. That's a ton so, of water. That's a ton of water. A lot of water to do that. But I've seen it. I've seen people in psych wards with psychogenic polydipsy and we have to turn off their toilets, their showers. Uh, I mean, they'll drink right out of the toilet trying to yeah. get water. in. Yeah, yeah that's it's crazy. Um, so my general recommendation is you want to drink constantly while exercising and then while you're up and awake, try to take a good swig of water every 15 minutes. And it seems following osmolality studies in your urine, uh, which we do here, that that is an adequate amount. You're not dehydrated, you're not uh, overhydrated. Um, 
And really that's all your body needs. Now, some people like to drink more. Uh, drinking cold water lowers, uh, changes your appetite. Uh, it, some people feel better when they drink more water. So again, that's back to that individualization of health. Uh, do what's best for you. But at the very least, I suggest a drink of water every 15 minutes while awake. It's the simplest way to do it. So good question. Yeah, really good question. Um, so back to just uh, who would need higher protein uh, content. I think that's important too, to differentiate that. Uh, it would be anybody who's athletic or training. When you're sick, you need more protein. Stressed, I was just talking about our world today, uh, needs more protein. Maintaining or losing weight, dieting practices, all these people need protein. But again, it's so individualized. Uh, it's tough to really tell you exactly, okay, this is how much you need. Now, what I can tell you is what defines a good protein. That's very important is what is a good protein? Because I always like to joke that the quality of proteins more than comparing spam to sirloin. It's really what else is involved in this protein. So when I look at a food, I look at the protein content, but you also have to look at the fat and carbohydrate content of that protein, your total calories, how quickly it's absorbed. That's a very important point because of the hormonal uh, response to food and micronutrients involved with the protein. For example, uh, fish is a great source of B vitamins and, and omega-3 fatty acids. So thinking of other micronutrients when I'm picking a good quality protein and then cost. Cost is very important because uh, like I said, the people that need more protein are usually higher stress. And if they spend all their money on protein, they're going to be more stressed. Uh, terrible. So that's very important. When you look at the amount of calories or other uh, macronutrients, some ones with good combos that are well balanced would be your dairy, your beans, and nuts and seeds. Those are great balance of carbs, protein, and fat. Those are very, very good foods. They are slightly higher in calories. Uh, so if you're calorie conscious, um, having six bags of almonds a day is probably not a good idea. Um, obviously high fat meats. So your marbled steaks are probably uh, not as beneficial as your leaner steaks. And then if you're doing protein powders or bars, uh, consider the carbohydrate source, particularly if it's anything artificial. Um, uh, I'm thinking, trying, I just spaced all my uh, artificial stuff. Oh, cor how about corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, rice syrup, uh, mannitol, that's a sugar alcohol, um, sucrose, uh, crisp rice is another one you'll see it sweetened with. Those are all things to consider because especially the artificial sweeteners uh, can cause issues in some people. Um, some of the lower glycemic sources found in these protein powders and whatnot are anything that end with OL. Those are your sugar alcohols like mannitol, lactol, glycerol. Um, the problem with those is anything with an OL tends to cause loose stools in people. Um, so again, you have to make it uh, very specific to you. Um, the other thing with quality protein is uh, the speed of absorption. Uh, the faster absorbing proteins are going to be of, for example, greater benefit following exercise because you want that hormonal response right away. But someone who's metabolically challenged or has insulin resistance or whatnot, you probably don't want to drink your protein. You want to chew it. So it's slower, it's absorbed more slowly, and you don't get such a massive rush of insulin and all those hormones that are uh, trying to get after it. Um, so that's just something to think about there. I tend, and Rich, and all you guys that have talked, we've talked for years, you know, I'd much rather you chew your food than drink it, uh, just because there's so many advantages to how your body responds to the food with chewing versus drinking it. So something to consider there. The uh, micronutrients, the two, like I said, uh, cold water fish is an excellent source of vitamin B12 in particular, omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, beef and chicken are good sources of zinc and uh, iron, depends on where you get your chicken. Uh, the protein powders are usually fortified with calcium, whatever that's worth. Um, I'm trying to think of any other protein. Oh, the phytoestrogens and soy protein. Why well, I'm not usually a big fan of soy, but those are there too. Um, cost wise, I think was the other thing I mentioned cost, uh, to give you some cost examples, tuna is cheaper than red meat, uh, red meat's cheaper than dairy 
and a lot of the supplements are cheaper than even that. So uh, when you're concerned with cost in your protein, I think that has to be considered too, back to the individualization of uh, your protein intake. Anything else you want to cover on protein there, Rich? I think I talked for a while there. Sorry. No, I think you, I think you got everything. I'm sure there's other questions on other stuff too, but that's great. That was great information. I you did know. take that, right? <laughs> yes, I got it recorded for you. I yeah. see. All right, because we have some questions from people that aren't here, so thank you. Yeah, you quick bet. question on protein. Um, since uh, digesting, obviously, like you said, it's better to eat it. Is it if you really want to get a lot of protein, would it be good to eat something small, protein wise? And you can mix a protein drink in with it just to get everything from saliva the whole way down to a small intestine going? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, drinking your protein isn't necessarily bad. I didn't mean to make it sound like that. If you if you don't have insulin resistance or any metabolic issues, you can drink all you want. And that's not going to hurt you any. Just the response, the, the body's system works better. The second you smell food, all the hormones start to wire up. When you start chewing food, it stimulates uh, enzymes in your mouth and your salivary glands, your pancreas to start kicking in. And so your body's better prepared for that food. So it could be argued that it's processed better when you chew versus drinking. So combining a protein drink with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or an apple or something where you're chewing. Yeah, that's a great option for you. Again, if you don't have to worry about anything metabolic. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Good question. What else you good people got? I have a question. One of my clients is curious if, uh, if they're lifting multiple times a week, do you think they should up their protein amount or should they keep it consistent to the one gram per body pound per, yeah, per body pound every day? I would say in general, how are they recovering? Are their goals being hit? Are they feeling okay? They're not excessively tired after exercise or they're not being woken up in the middle of the night because they can't sleep. Um, that would be more of a question. If they're recovering appropriately, then their protein's probably fine. If they're not, they may want to change that macronutrient content a little in their diet and see if it helps. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good question too. What else you got, Richie? You're on mute, Rich. Oh, yeah. Unmute, unmute yourself, sir. Sorry. Oh, I had a question. Sorry. <laughs> From I have my dog, so I'm afraid they're going to start barking again. Oh, um, gotcha. I thought your wife might have liked that button. That's why she put it there. No, she likes that button a lot. If, if yeah, that's, that's what I thought. That's <laughs> the first thing in the morning when I wake up and I'm like flying around here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, he had a question about gut health. He said, um, where did I, oh, can you ask him about fixing gut health, lowering cortisol? And he says, I struggle endlessly with my stomach. Sure. Oh, that's, that's, that's a good one because gut health is so important to your overall health, which everyone kind of knows now. Um, let me give, just some basic anatomy of the gut to help you understand how to optimize it. The first thing anatomically that people need to realize about the gut is the, its separation from the outside to the inside is one cell layer thick. <clears throat> That's it. So you can imagine anything rough, high cortisol levels, toxins in your environment, processed foods, breaks down that one cell layer thick the differentiates inside from outside. And what I like to do, I wish my camera was here, but I take, I like to do this little analogy. I take a pin and I put it on my forearm and I run, run it up my forearm into my mouth and then pretend I've never lift the pin as I go through that whole tube called the gut until I come out the other side. And that's just to emphasize that that tube is outside your body. And because of that, your immune system, 80% of your immune system and lymphatic tissue surrounds that tube. It's as if the good Lord knew if you're going to get exposed to something you shouldn't be exposed to, it's going to come in your mouth, right? So with that one cell layer thick uh, lining gets beaten up or destroyed and you get that quote unquote leaky gut, which you've heard about, 
that's what triggers all sorts of issues with your body because your immune system's right there and says, what are you doing? And, and just some quick anatomy on immune system. So when you were a tiny baby, you had a huge gland under your chest bone called a thymus. And the thymus is kind of like your immune system's boot camp. And so what little thymic cells, little T cells would do, they run out to your, let's say they'd run out to your knee and they'd come back with a piece of your knee tissue and it would ask the, the sergeant at the boot camp, hey, is this good or bad? And the sergeant would say, that's your knee, you dummy, and it's smacking, right? And then everyone in the thymus would know that, okay, don't leave the knee alone. But let's say another guy ran out and found a bacteria or a virus floating around, brings it back and the thymus says, good job those are bad. So your thymus literally trains your immune system to recognize self from non-self. Now, part of that, when your gut lining's normal and you eat your digestive enzymes to start with your teeth and salivary amylase, your pancreatic enzymes, the way your stomach churns, the acid in your stomach, the bile that comes from your liver and gallbladder, all these things break down food into their basic components. So uh, your carbohydrates get into sugars. Your fats are grabbed by bile and transported across that single layer uh, in something called chylomicrons. And then the amino acids are broken down to individual, or excuse me, protein is broken down to individual amino acid constituents. Your body, if, if your gut's functioning well, these sugars, fats and amino acids are being absorbed and your immune system leaves them alone. They say, oh yeah, that's supposed to be here. That's feeding me. When the gut gets broken down, and again, I've said this and I'll say it again, the number one reason for gut breakdown is high cortisol levels, so stress, then your entire tube doesn't work as well because the, the salivary enzymes, the pancreatic enzymes, the bile, the, the way the stomach churns, or let's say you're taking a bunch of antacids because you have reflux, so now you don't break down protein at all. So larger than amino acid proteins called peptides, so you have amino acids, then peptides, then whole proteins. These peptides that aren't broken down into their individual amino acid uh, constituents slip across that leaky gut into the uh, immune system, and the immune system sees it and goes, wait a minute. I don't recognize that protein. That is a foreigner. And it, because it's not been trained in boot, thymus boot camp, that that is okay, it attacks it. Well, just like any good military, if you have an enemy, you don't just attack it, you build up a full army to attack it. And so your immune system starts the whole process of building an, an immune response to that protein. And what happens is because there's only 20, 21, depending on who you talk to, pro amino acids out there. So different combos make different peptides and whatnot. They're eating a protein that's not broken down may stimulate your immune system to start recognizing you as foreign. And the classic one, the one that's been well-researched and very well-documented is the protein in bread called gluten. If gluten crosses your your uh, gut barrier there um, via a leaky gut, via higher cortisol levels, gluten's attacked because it's not recognized. And that same bunch of immune system armies that sees the gluten goes after your thyroid. That has been very well linked up. The uh, autoimmune thyroiditis, we call it Hashimoto's disease, can literally be cured if people get off gluten. We calm that army down. But that goes for, I mean, there has been a, there was just a research article in uh, the Lancet Endocrinology, which is a European article on associating uh, psoriasis and certain proteins, red meat in particular. And so, and it's not that red meat's bad, it's just that if it's not broken down to its amino acid parts and peptides, larger groups of amino acids slip into the system, it can stimulate the immune system to now start attacking the skin and people get psoriatic skin lesions or they get psoriatic arthritis, um, all from your food. So the reason I told you that big long story so you can see, okay, this is what the gut does. It's very important. Gut bacteria is involved in this because it also helps break foods down. It regulates things. And there's something called, uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys are aware of the gut-brain connection. 
uh, there's a nerve called the vagus nerve. Vagus stands for a wanderer uh, because it's in different places than everybody, but that's a direct connection between your brain and your gut. And your gut bacteria produce 90% of the neurotransmitters in your body. So your brain only has 10% of the serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, histamine, acetylcholine, uh, uh, tyrosine, all these different uh, neurotransmitters. Your gut has 90% of them. So via this vagus nerve, they talk back and forth. Well, these same good bacteria that make that stuff, when you have a leaky gut or high cortisol levels, start changing. Or even worse and more common, you're feeding these bacteria McDonald's, processed foods, chemicals, toxins. And, and I like to relate gut bacteria with politicians, right? They're all scumbags. And the, what do a scumbag eat? Every politician I know eats at McDonald's 24-7 because scumbags eat crappy food. Well, the same for your gut bacteria. Gut back, bad gut bacteria eat crappy food. Good bacteria eat vegetables and fruit because that's where short chain fatty acids come from, which are the prebiotics. And so part of this, why I'm giving you so much, healing the gut is your diet. And But here's the catch 22. People that have gut issues or bloating or leaky bowel, when they try to eat vegetables, usually feel worse. And that's because you pissed off the McDonald's eaters and they don't want that stuff. So they get fired up and people get bloated and stuff. So I usually suggest some uh, short chain fatty acid supplements for 30 days for people with bad guts. Um, Thorn Research makes a good one called Arabinix. Um, and you just do a scoop in water once a day and you start feeding your good bacteria. Uh, the next thing to do is get good bacteria in you. And I don't, I've, I've, I've always been a fan of probiotics, but I've really started to shift away from that um, and just having people do natural uh, probiotics in uh, homemade yogurt, kefir, uh, kimchi, sauerkraut, et cetera, uh, rather than a probiotic. But if you do a probiotic, it's best if you do a what we call a poop test, a stool test, to look at which bacteria you have and which ones you need. Then we can specifically prescribe the right probiotic for you. If that's uh, not available, then starting with a good lactobacillus is, uh, with some bifidobacterium is probably your best bet to start. But the secret with probiotics is never do the same one more than a month because it's just like humans, ultimate power equals ultimate corruption. If you take the same probiotic more than a month, it will start taking over your system and you're not better anymore. And how many people possibly on this phone call have said that, yeah, I took probiotics, did great for a while, now my gut stinks again. Well, I suggest you start by changing your probiotic. Oh, one more thing for gut health um, that I should add, besides taking Arabinex like that, fermented foods. And this is what I do, and I have almost everyone I know doing it, and that's just doing a spoonful of sauerkraut or kimchi, if you like South Korean food, a day. Just one tablespoon a day to maintain gut health does wonders and if you like this stuff put it on everything you will be amazed how good your gut feels if you decide to eat sauerkraut with your lucky charms every morning it's pretty wild um, the other thing in that same line of thinking uh, that's so important uh, besides the uh, good prebiotic the good probiotic is supporting that single cell layer uh, that separates you from the rest of the world in your gut. And I mentioned this earlier, it is the best supplement for this, it's L-glutamine. L-glutamine actually nourishes and rebuilds that cell, single cell layer in your gut. And so let me give you a, a, a day of gut healing. Um, wake up in the morning, have a big spoonful of kimchi or sauerkraut, uh, have some yogurt, uh, with some fruit, some homemade yogurt with some fruit or some kimchi or excuse me, some kefir or something in the morning for breakfast for gut health. Then have your eggs and bacon or whatever else you like to eat, your protein, right? Then about two hours later when your stomach's empty, take five grams of um, L-glutamine in water. I like the powder. Just slam it down in water and do that at least two times, preferably three times throughout the day five grams of L-glutamine on an empty stomach to heal your gut. And really that is the most simple, basic 
gut healing program I could give you. Now, if, of course, if I could study your, your poop, I could tell you a lot more detail, um, like are you absorbing your fats and proteins and is there markers of inflammation and all this stuff. But that is probably the simplest, easiest way to start on a path of good health, uh, gut health is that little regimen right there. Boy, you shouldn't ask that question, dude. I think I like that topic. <laughs> that was good. Let's do the poop test. Yeah, the poop test is awesome. I'm telling you, if it wasn't so darn expensive, I would have everyone do it. It's, a, it's an $1,800 test. I get it for just a little over 600 for all my patients. But dang it, that's still expensive. I'm, someday it's going to be cheaper and everyone should have their poop analyzed. A lot of information there. <laughs> <laughs> especially for people like me right buddy i'm so full of shit you know you learn all sorts of stuff i don't want to say anything yeah i know it. it's all good <laughs> other questions who has more questions uh, why well, i had one related to the gut health uh, um because i had seen some some mention and I, I won't call it research thing but I'll just say call it articles where they were where they were saying that uh that probiotics might actually be detrimental for your microbiome, but it might be related to what you were just mentioning, or you don't want to take, take one for more than a month. I'm not sure exactly what the source of the, the problems were that they were trying to identify. That is exactly right, my friend. Two problems. One, if you take it longer than a month, it does take over. Uh, I mean, literally, it takes over. Uh, and that's why I use the old ultimate power equals ultimate corruption. If they are if they're taking over your gut, they're going to wipe out all the rest of your bacteria and you're going to lose all sorts of benefits. But two, that's where very specific probiotics, you can't just walk into Fred Meyers or Safeway and grab a probiotic off the shelf and think it's going to do you wonders. Uh, the best analogy I have for that is, let's say um, you were diagnosed with uh, a lot of makeup disease. Let's say you're diagnosed with um, psoriatic arthritis and we're gonna put you on a medication. What if I laid out all the medications on a shelf in front of you and said, okay, pick one. You see the inherent danger there. And because we in the medical world say, okay, I know exactly which medicine I need for your psoriatic arthritis, because I know you, I know the interactions, reactions, side effects, long-term effects, short-term effects of each of these medicines that I know before I prescribe it to you so I can individualize that treatment. If I just listed out a bunch of meds for you and said, good luck, you're going to kill yourself. Uh, and that's basically what they're saying with the probiotics out there is if you don't know exactly which bacteria you're lacking or which ones you may need, you may take one you don't that actually could be detrimental to you. And that's where that, uh, uh, that paper you read and stuff is coming from. And a lot of people in the gut health world are shifting from oral probiotics unless you have a study of your own microbiome done to see what you're lacking. So good question. Yeah, yeah I quit taking them after I read, read that article. Yeah, you know, I haven't taken them for years now just because I've been concerned for a while. And we do all our own homemade yogurt. Um, that's my favorite homemade treat. We we make kumbacha uh, in my house, but I have to admit that uh, the kids like the store-bought kumbacha better than the ones I try to make. Mine are a little tangy. Uh, I just put vodka in mine, then it's fine, but I can't do that with the kids. So um, how's that for gut health? Kill it with a little vodka and then fix it with kumbacha? Brilliant. Anyway, um, so that's why I like the natural sources to keep your gut healthy. But then again, the L-glutamine, a spoonful of kimchi or sauerkraut a day, that's where every one of us should start if we're worried about our gut. So are store-bought yo yogurt still good for your gut anyway? Uh, yeah, you know, you want to get a specific brand. Um, uh, it'll say live cultured yogurt. But here's what the studies are showing about that. You guys will crack up at this is they're estimating that 90 to almost 100% of the live cultured yogurt, by the time you take it off the shelf and take it home, is dead. <laughs> so that's why I like the homemade stuff better. Um, there's so many places now you can buy the seeds. Um, 
and what I try to do, and this is what we do, uh, most of you guys and gals know Jared, uh, my dietitian. He finds out in his visit with patients, as do I, uh, who makes their own homemade stuff. And then I may say, hey, Mrs. Jones, can I do a, use your stuff for, to start a new batch for me? And just trade amongst friends the different uh, starters. And now you're getting all sorts of variety of bacteria. Um, yeah, I think that's a much better thing than store-bought, especially with more friendship, friendship bread. What's that? So that's like friendship bread where, you know, you keep a little bit of the bread yeah. <laughs> aside and you share it with other people and it eventually it gets kind of spread all over. Exactly. Yep. Absolutely right. Whoa. That's good. Good. Gut health is so important. You know, I, people come to me all the time for hormones and I tell them, I can do your hormones, but we got to make sure your gut's working well because a lot of the hormonal breakdown process into active constituents of hormones occurs in the gut. So very important. Well, More questions? Darren? No? I have I have a whole bunch, but I don't want to keep asking. I don't want to I'll see the floor. <laughs> I think you're all right, buddy. If anyone else does, go for it. I had something about the delayed eating technique. Oh, sure. Debt uh -huh. dieting. Now famously or okay. infamously called um, intermittent fasting. Intermittent so, fasting. Yeah. yeah so, like, go ahead. Why well, I, well, I had it like a, <clears throat> if you want, you want to talk about it in general, but I had it like, I was reading something where they're, I think it was talking about, they call it intermittent fasting, but you know, uh, delayed eating technique, whatever you want to call it, where they were, they were pinpointing some benefits, um, at, at 24 hours, right. Where, and, and I don't know if it's because it, because of where it puts your insulin level at, but you know, like the sweet spot is it starts, it, it starts around like 16 hours of not eating, you know, or you reduce your window to like six to eight hours a day, but that they were also showing some significant benefits up to 24 hours. I don't know if that's ever recommended for somebody to really fast for a day to sure oh to this help. is a great question i'll give you the whole spiel so <laughs> first and foremost um okay i won't give you the whole spiel we won't be here all night but uh, first and foremost fasting uh is so good for your body it resets so many things it improves insulin sensitivity to start in all tissues uh the 16 hour marks kind of question some most people's authorities say five or six hours and your insulin sensitivity is increased in your liver and your muscles fat may take a little longer to increase insulin sensitivity the uh, fat burning hormones glucagon which is insulin's antagonist goes up so you actually start utilizing fat more often after fasting the 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 thyroid works better. You have an increase in T3 receptor uh, availability uh, with fasting. So your, your thyroid function works better. I mean, I could go on and on with the list of why it's a good idea to fast. The fear has been, well, if I fast too much, I'm going to lose muscle. My body will start burning muscle. And we kind of mentioned that earlier. We talked about glutamine being used as a sugar source uh, unless it's in your diet. What the good studies have shown that that really doesn't happen till roughly 90 hours. If you fast more than 90 hours, you get into some major metabolic breakdown. Um, so shorter fast, the intermittent fast, the delayed eating technique of 8, 10, 12, 16 hours may be of great benefit for people that have issues with those hormones for one. Um, if you come at it from strictly a caloric intake side, the argument would be, well, okay, I fast for 16 hours. That means I only have eight hours to stuff my face, and therefore my total caloric load will be lessened. I don't really agree with that because I've seen how much some people can eat in eight hours. Uh, so I go more with the hormonal response to the fasting versus what happens during those eight hours of eating. But I think it can be very beneficial. And I suggest debt dieting for anyone who has hormonal issues, high cortisol levels, everything I talk about in my book, Obtainable, um, that's why the eating plans in there are based on debt 
dieting one version of them is because that just resets the hormones it helps heal the gut uh, it does all these things to benefit uh, you and that's why I'm a big fan of it it's not new intermittent fasting has uh, been around um, well, like I said, we called it debt dieting in the early 90s. And basically, we would just skip breakfast and lunch, train real hard, and then just eat as much as you could until you went to bed at night. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, it was actually a chapter in Better Than Steroids. Uh, but I took it out um, because uh, it was too long. So I just stuck with the four basic eating plans, the keto, zigzag, modified card drop, and isocaloric or isonutrient in better than steroids. So it's not a new thing. There's actually a ton of research on it out there. Um, but it's just becoming more and more popular because uh, people like fads, I guess. But it'll kind of slow down and disappear. But those of us who understand its, its physiological mechanisms will still be prescribing it. Hey, Warren, I have a quick question about fasting. Sure. Um, how would somebody with hypoglycemia fast? Oh, great question. So we have to understand that has to be, I'm trying to think of a, the best way to put this. So there's true hypoglycemia where blood sugar goes below 60. And the funny thing about that is that's even not that sensitive because some people when their blood sugar hits 90, they feel like heck in a handbasket. So, but 60 is the official hypoglycemic term. Most people with hypoglycemic episodes have normal blood sugar when they feel that way. What happens is they have a higher insulin release, so they're mildly insulin resistant or they're hyper insulin secretors. And higher insulin levels, no matter what the blood sugar will do, if you're not eating, will stimulate the sympathetic nervous system to fire. Your body goes into holy shit mode and you have a rapid heart rate, you're anxious, you're sweating, you're nauseous, you're dizzy because your body's telling you to eat. The problem with that is it's very hard to distinguish is it truly low blood sugar or is it a sympathomimetic response from elevated insulin. That being said, if it is the former, if it is true hypoglycemia, intermittent fasting is probably not a good idea because your blood sugar will drop too low and you will not feel good. If it's the other, if it's more of a uh, sympathomimetic or sympathetic nervous system response to higher insulin levels, then the treatment's on the insulin levels. Using cinnamon, using berberine, um, using a few supplements like that, uh, using um, branch chain amino acids in powder form and drinking them throughout your fast, uh, rather than eating, will all keep insulin at bay and you won't have those symptoms. That makes sense, Carrie? Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, thank you. Good, you hey, bet. Just to, just to add to that, as you know, when I did the shows and all that, I uh, did that a lot, you know, I fasted a lot. <laughs> yeah. And um, I had that issue also, by the way. Um, but I did what you told me and I did the amino acid or the aminos drink before and after my workout uh -huh. and it was and I was, and I was totally fine and some days i i could wait until one o'clock in the afternoon to lift i didn't eat all day and i was fine it was really right. interesting i think the first couple of days i think more mentally it started to kind of weigh on me but after a while i, I really never had an issue with that at all and actually i felt way better nice so anyway just to add that to carrie's uh, question Awesome. Yeah, I have some, uh, I, I have a lot of my clients go to a drugstore and get a little glucometer, a little thing where you prick your finger and check your blood sugar. If you feel you're that way, uh, because that's an easy, simple and cheap way to tell if you're uh, version one or version two of that hypoglycemia I described. But it's also good if you want to see if you have an insulin problem, because there's a test I mentioned of, obtainable, which I think everyone should do and follow. Uh, and that's do a one hour postprandial sugar load. In other words, eat a big meal or eat your regular meal and one hour later, check your blood sugar. If it's not under 140, either you ate a lot of pasta or you're mildly insulin resistant. It's one of the earliest, simplest way to start a workup and have me see or someone to start say, okay, let's see if there is an issue here or did you just really eat too much pasta? 
I just this morning had a patient. I have a couple of patients that we're trying to figure out that do that. And she kept a log of all her one hour postprandial, or which means after eating blood sugars over a couple of weeks. And she had one right in the middle. I think it was on the uh, uh, 6th of October where her blood sugar was 160 an hour after she ate and I emailed her back and I said, um, what exactly did you eat? Because all the rest were normal. All the rest were under 140. What did you eat that night? And she wrote back, ha, 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 ha. My Italian mother was in, mother-in-law was in town and we had the biggest pasta dinner I've ever eaten. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I laugh. Okay, you either ate a lot of pasta or you have an issue. Uh, because her only time, and that's that's neat to see because the other power in that is okay, if I eat pasta, I need to be really aware of this, right? And I think it gives people power to understand what food does to them by doing that simple little trick. Um, and you by doing that, you can start food combining. Maybe I need more protein when I do have carbs to keep my blood sugars lower, or maybe that, that uh, particular uh, meal was too easily absorbed. Maybe it was some, um, you know, like it was uh, – a rice that you cook too long so it's immediately absorbed versus rice that you only cook for five minutes and it's absorbed slowly that changes the glycemic load of it it's a neat little test to do and i'd encourage everyone to do it once in a while just to get an idea how your body's responding to your food any questions on that You called it uh, a dieting technique, but I think like in your in your book, it seems more like it's a, let's say a sustained way of eating. Like that's between that, I think you had different uh, MCDs where you would either go from like, you know, three days of that and then two days of, you know, regular three meals a day or, mm -hmm. you know, five and five and two or six and one, depending on how much you really need it. But that it, it isn't that it's, I, I think of dieting as something that <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm using the, the thing about the term uh, incorrectly, but think about that as, as something that you do short term, not long term, right? <laughs> Maybe that's the, the fat kid definition of dieting. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so is it, is it something that's like you would recommend more sustained, you know, life, life decision, life choice kind of way to eat? I do. I use dieting to figure out how you should eat the rest of your life. Because I agree with you. Semantically speaking, the word diet means short term. Uh, and I think that's intuitive, if not natural to most people. Um, oh, I'm on a diet and therefore they see the end of the tunnel. They know they can get out of it someday and go back to their bonbons and Twinkies. And so I use dieting, the the different type of keto runs, uh, the um, intermittent fasting or debt dieting, the isonutrients, whatnot, to help you figure out where you, one, function best, two, maintain fat loss or, or, or your fat percentage the best, three, maintain your lean mass the best, four, your quality of life's good. Use those dieting techniques to figure out what you need to do the rest of your life. And I think, and you guys all know this because I've shared this, I live on a five to two modified carb drop. Monday through Friday, I do not eat any carbs. Saturday and Sunday, I can do what I want. Every once in a while, I'll do some intermittent fasting. Um, it's more than, more uh, because my schedule's crazy. Like, let's say uh, this Thursday is a great, great example. I lecture all Thursday morning, and I'm not going to have a chance to eat. So rather than being sitting around pissed off that I can't eat, I'm planning ahead. Okay, I'm not going to eat until three, and then I'll be fine with it. So I use that as part of my lifestyle. Um, so yeah, that's a great point there, my friend. It's a diet to me, semantically, is short term, but use those diets to figure out what works for you long term. That's an excellent point. I don't want to keep it too long, Warren. I know you've got a lot of things to do too, but is there any last questions for Warren, for anybody? And we, can do, we can do this, honestly, as often as you want. My schedule's really allowed me a lot of more freedom. And Monday nights are great. As a matter of fact, we're good. I pick up my boy in, oh, 15 minutes from Taekwondo, so I'm good. This is perfect. 
Okay, yeah, because we we'll, we definitely going to talk to you again about the holiday eating. Um, oh yes, I don't, I don't have an issue with that, but some of the other people might. <laughs> 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 Hey, I have a really good test for you on the low blood sugar. You know how you said you had a test for the high blood sugar? Uh-huh. I have a good one for the low blood sugar. Uh, my wife does it when I'm being a jerk. And she tells, and she tells me to eat. <laughs> so that works great. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah I think Snickers what? has a commercial about that. Oh, that's awesome. Snickers. The Snickers commercials. Oh, oh yeah. I have seen those. I think if I I'm, I know everyone and everyone's face I see or names I see, uh, most of us are, if not all of us, are parents. And one of the best words of advice I got from a sweet little lady years ago, she said, listen, the only reason your kids cry is if they're tired or hungry. And I've taken that and applied that now to everyone I meet. The only reason people are asses is if they're tired or hungry. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good way to look at life. Oh man, you need a nap. Or here, sir, have this, this uh, protein bar, right? That's funny. <laughs> and some people, they need to go take a nap and eat the protein bar. So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, thanks, Warren. We'll get you back on here again. And uh, if you can send that link. And if you guys have questions for Warren, if you let me know through Slack, I can contact Warren and he can answer if he had something he didn't want to ask in front of everybody or. Absolutely. Okay. And I will I'll um, I'll share my 10 page Google doc with you, Rich, that has all my questions. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, on, on that note, no. <laughs> <laughs> I will, uh, I'll get this um, recording done and email it out to y'all as well. Thank you, Warren. And, and also, uh, so most of you guys know that we're, going to be starting our book study on, on Warren's, uh, on Dr. Willie's new book, Obtainable. So most of you guys already have it now, but if you don't, you want one, let me know because we're going to start that next week. So I'll have questions on your book and a little test, Warren. So maybe you can see if you can pass your own test. Okay. It's a deal. <laughs> I love it. So, all right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. For yeah. being well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thanks, Bye-bye thanks now. You too. Thank you. Well, I hope you got some great information from that podcast on protein and gut health. Go to my website, drwilly.com, D-R-W-I-L-L-E-Y.com. If you have any questions, want to email me. If you're interested in setting up a similar webinar type, we do it through the Zoom platform, setting up a webinar with your friends, families, colleagues, whatnot, where we just sit and talk. I'll take any question you can throw at me in the health, fitness, exercise, nutrition, autoimmune disease, preventative medicine, you name it. I love it. Bring it on. We could have a great time. If you're interested, go to my website, shoot me an email, and I'll have uh, some information set to you. Until next time, remember, Recovery Medicine, we meet you where you are. I can't change your stressors, but I can certainly help your body and mind deal with them better. Until next time. Thank you for joining Warren on the Recover Me podcast with Warren Willie, your guide to living a naturally healthier, happier life. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Google Play, or wherever you find your best podcasts. To connect with Warren and the community, learn more about naturally healthy living, and claim a free resource to improve your health right away, visit drwilly.com. You'll find all of Dr. Willie's resources there, including best-selling books like Better Than Steroids, The Z Diet, What does your doctor look like naked? And his latest book, Obtainable. Enjoy the body and energy you've always wanted beyond diet and exercise. That's drwilly.com, D-R-W-I-L-L-E-Y.com. And until next time with Warren, get fit, be healthy, live life.